So hello everyone. Uh, I think we can get started. And um, before the speaker give the presentation, um, our associate director um, Ralph Ferrero will be introducing Dr. Liang. Ralph, please go ahead. Yeah, I just yeah I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our speaker today, Dr. Ruby Liang from uh, Pacific Northwest West National Laboratory, or she's a Patel Fellow. Um, She's a world renowned scientist um, and leads the, or she's a chief scientist as, as well as uh, the Department of Energy and leads the um, uh, exascale earth system uh, model, uh, which, is a, which is a huge endeavor. Um, and she's going to talk to us about uh, mesoscale convective systems and just a few other things about our speakers, very distinguished scientist. Um, uh, not only with her research, but is involved with uh, a lot of different activities. She's um, on the board of the uh, Atmospheric uh, Sciences and Climate Group at the National Academy, right? National Academy of Sciences. Uh, she's editor, Journal of HydroMed, and is a fellow of a lot of um, major scientific uh, organizations uh, that we're all familiar with. So. Uh, uh, without without saying more, we're just going to turn it over to uh, Ruby and learn about uh, mesoscale convective systems. All right, thank you very much for the nice introduction, and thank you for the invitation to present. Um, so I'm going to talk about mesoscale convective systems in observations and a hierarchy of models. Uh, before I get into the main content, I really want to emphasize that what I'm presenting today is really a part of team efforts. I want to first of all acknowledge uh, DOE for supporting our research. Most of the most of the work that I'll be presenting uh, are part of uh, this project called Water Cycle and Climate Extreme Modeling or WEXAM scientific focus area. But I'll also be showing some results from the Youth RSM project as well as another project called Exascale Computing Project. So I want to highlight uh, a lot of the uh, collaborators and my colleagues um, working with me um, on this particular topic. So first of all, let's um, uh, exp uh, talk a little bit, a little bit about uh, what mesoscale convective systems are. Um, MCS are really important and they are not um, the same as just the typical kind of cumulus clouds that we are thinking about. And, and, and here we can contrast them very nicely. Um, for example, a mesoscale convective system, as you can see in this schematic, is a really big um, uh, contiguous cumulolimbus cloud complex. And, and so, it, in, in fact, it's the biggest type of thunderstorm. Um, they typically occupy horizontal dimensions of hundreds to thousands of kilometers, and they last pretty long, like sometimes can be up to 10 to 24 hours. And so this is rather different from the typical cumulus clouds that we are talking about that has horizontal dimension of less than 10 kilometers. And these cumulus clouds usually only last for just a few hours. So to get into mesoscale convective systems or MCS a little bit more, uh, let's take a look at a cross section of MCS, uh, which is shown by uh, Bob House as a, a very nice schematic. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, these type of systems, they occupy pretty large in space. Um, they typically have a convective core, but also a very large um, uh, upper level cloud, uh, cool cloud shield, um, and you can generally also see a very well organized mesoscale circulation associated with this um, because of the large expansive area of uh, coverage. Uh, it also produces um, heavy precipitation in the convective core, but also very large area uh, with precipitation as well. Um, so MCS is a key element of the global circulation. Even back in 2004, a really nice study by Schumacher showing that because of the um, particular structure of MCS with these um, expensive area of upper level cloud producing stratiform precipitation, and therefore uh, these top heavy heating profile, when they prescribe a top heavy heating profile in a climate model or an atmospheric model, they see that um, this kind of uh, latent heating can induce strong circulation response, uh, large scale circulation response, particularly at the upper troposphere. So, so meaning that this kind of system can really drive um, strong circulation and be a very important part of the global circulation. 
Uh, besides the impact on the global circulation, MCS is also a key element of the water cycle. So we know, for example, in, in the United States, in the central United States, a lot of the precipitation during the warm season, uh, between 30 to 70 percent of the, of the rain comes from MCSs. And they are also responsible for a lot of the extreme precipitation. So this study in particular look at um, during different season uh, what contribute to extreme precipitation east of the Rocky Mountain in the central and, and the eastern United States, showing that during the summertime MCS is a key part uh, contributing to extreme rainfall. Uh, in our own work, we have also particularly um, separate out uh, mesoscale connective systems, uh, the type of rainfall produced by MCS versus non-MCS rainfall, which could be coming from uh, simple um, deep convective clouds, but also can be coming from stratiform cloud. So I, I want to highlight two particular features. Uh, the first one is the dino cycle. So we, we see that um, based on observation of MCS precipitation shown in the solid uh, or bulk curve over here versus non-MCS precipitation. You can see a clear difference in terms of the diurnal timing. So MCS produced heaviest precipitation during midnight, whereas um, uh, other types of uh, um, rainfall, or we call it non-MCS rainfall, typically peaks around like late afternoon 6 p.m. Um, in addition to the difference in the diurnal cycle, we can also see a big difference in the precipitation intensity as well. So MCS tends to produce much heavier rain rate compared to non-MCS precipitation. So in a study that we published back in 2019, we quantified the difference between MCS precipitation and non-MCS precipitation in the United States. And we, we see that MCS precipitation is about seven times as strong compared compared to non-MCS precipitation. But at the same time, it's more intermittent in both space and time. So it doesn't uh, occur as frequently in both space and time compared to non-MCS rainfall. Um, so the three science questions that I'm going to discuss today are basically listed over here. Um, because of the importance of MCS in both the global circulation as well as the water cycle, we wanted to see how well models, uh, especially different types of modeling approaches, are able to simulate MCSs. And then we also want to know uh, what limits the predictability of MCS particularly over the U.S. during summertime, or the other way around, what contributes to the predictability of MCS during summer? And then lastly, I'm going to also talk about how we might expect MCS to respond to global warming and therefore contribute to changes in the mean and extreme precipitation in the central United States. So I will start with the first question. Uh, so how well MCS is sim are simulated uh, using different modeling approaches? Um, several studies have already um, kind of looked at that climate models may not be able to skillfully simulate MCSs. And mostly these studies infer that models are not able to do that because, as I mentioned before, MCSs, they tend to have different diurnal cycle and also they produce heavier precipitation compared to non-MCS. Therefore, in a particular study, for example, shown over here, when uh, Van Vievenberg um, suggests that models are not able to simulate MCS because apparently they do produce diurnal timing of the peak precipitation very different from the observed um, late afternoon diurnal timing. Uh, I mean, the, the late afternoon diurnal timing in the model very different from the observed um, diurnal timing, and therefore we, they can infer that models are not able to simulate MCSs. At the same time, another study suggests that models not able to simulate MCS because they also tend not to be able to produce the heavy uh, precipitation in, during the warm season compared to observation. But the, these studies um, do not particularly um, isolate the MCSs in the model simulations or in the observations. Therefore, um, in order to really look at MCSs, one of our key contribution um, uh, uh, discussed in several uh, studies where we develop methods that we can use to track MCSs in observations and model simulations. 
So we have produced several different data sets, some particularly over the US, and now we actually also have a global um, MCS data set. So these data sets are uh, uh, developed um, by tracking MCSs using several different types of data. As I mentioned before, MCS are characterized by having these really uh, cold cloud shield in the upper level, large, expensive stratiform area at the upper level and therefore the cloud shield are really cold and 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 therefore we needed to be able to detect and track mcs using satellite cloud top infrared radiation or brightness temperature but at the same time mcs's are also characterized by producing a lot of precipitation over large area and pretty heavy precipitation. Therefore, in, uh, in order to track MCS, we need to detect both the expensive upper level clouds as well as the large expensive precipitation feature. So in the US, we have very good data set, not only uh, provided by satellite data for the for the brightness temperature, but we also have mixed red uh, radar refractivity as well as the stage four precipitation. Uh, so by tracking these, um, cold cloud shield, as well as uh, the precipitation feature, we are able to produce an MCS data set for the US at hourly temporal resolution and at four kilometer spatial resolution. We repeated doing the same thing globally, but in the global data set, we mostly use uh, two kinds of data. The first, again, is the um, satellite data of the brightness temperature or the infrared radiation for the cold cloud shield. Uh, but we also make use of the GPM iMERGE precipitation data, which is available at hourly and at 10 kilometer resolution. So by tracking these two types of features, the cold cloud shield and also the precipitation feature, we have produced a, a near global data set between 60 degrees south and 60 degrees north uh, for the time period between 2000 to, uh, to 2019. So having these data sets really help us to be able to track MCS in observation and as well as model simulation. Uh, we are now able to look at global MCS characteristics. For example, uh, based on the MCS uh, global data set, we can look at uh, the spatial distribution of the MCS number, showing that over the tropics, a lot of MCSs are found um, in the ocean, um, but also uh, over the uh, wet areas, particularly tropical lands such as the Amazon, uh, the, the Sahel region, as well as over the maritime continent. Uh, by tracking MCSs, we can also look at the life cycle of MCS, such as like how long do they last? Like, so here we show the lifetime of MCSs, uh, the fractional precipitation contributed by MCS, as well as combining MCS with other data sets, such as um, uh, reanalysis data, we are able to look at the MCS uh, propagation or the translation speed, uh, showing differences um, over the tropics versus uh, the extra tropics. So now with this type of technique of tracking MCS in observation and model simulation, we started by looking at how well MCSs are simulated in a set of global models. So these global models contributed to a CMIP-6 experiments called high-risk MIPS. Uh, most of these simulations have spatial resolution between 25 to 50 kilometer resolution. <clears throat> so um, we first started looking at uh, tracking MCS only using the brightness temperature or the infrared radiation by tracking the large uh, cold cloud shield. Um, if we use this metric only, we find that in a particular model, so in this example is the U3SM, the DOE Energy Exascale Earth System model ran at 25 kilometer resolution. Uh, so the spatial, uh, the, the color uh, contours over here are the uh, observe number of MCSs, and then these contour lines are the model biases compared to the observation. And we see that if we only account for MCS by looking at the cold cloud shield, we counted too many uh, MCS compared to the observation, suggesting that the model tends to produce a lot of these large stratiform area that looks like MCSs. But if we account for also the precipitation feature, then we find that the model significantly under predict the number of MCS shown by these red contour lines, meaning it's a negative, uh, significantly under 
prediction, suggesting that even though the model is able to simulate large stratiform area looking like MCSs, but they are but the model is actually not able to produce the more intense precipitation associated with MCS. But looking more specifically over the central United States, we look at several different models with data available from high res MIP, including not only the youth resm model, but three other models like the HEDGEM model, the IPSL, as well as the NICAM model. Uh, we find that models have different skills in terms of simulating MCSs, but importantly, we find that generally models tend to be less skillful in the summertime compared to the springtime uh, over the central United States when MCS produce a lot of precipitation in both spring as well as the summer season. Um, so what might be some of the challenges in modeling MCSs? I, um, I think we can look at it this way, right? So global models or regional model, typically if you run your model at, let's say, anywhere between 25 to 100 kilometer resolution, models rely on convective parameterizations, which basically assume that you have a um, Cloud, you have a lot of these population of convective clouds in quasi equilibrium with the large scale circulation. And then combining the convection parameterization with cloud microphysics, then the model produces precipitation. But this view of convection is very different from what I showed before about MCSs, which are much bigger than these population of individual deep cumulus uh, convective clouds. Uh, these MCSs, they can be as big as a GCM model grid cell or even bigger than a GCM model grid cell. And, and also because of the um, vertical heating profile, which is rather different from this type of individual cumulus clouds, they can provide very different type of um, feedback to the large scale circulation. And, and therefore, we might expect that models using this type of parameterization may not be able to actually produce MCSs. Therefore, we have been looking at uh, several different ways where we might be able to explicitly resolve um, MCSs rather than relying on convective parameterization. So currently, I think there are several approaches available. So one is using regional model where we can get down to a pretty high resolution and we can turn off the deep, con deep convection scheme. But we also now have global variable resolution model where can we can also zoom into specific region get down to the resolution where we can turn off the deep convection scheme, as well as even potentially running this type of simulations globally at storm resolving scale. And I'm also going to show one example where we have a super parameterization embedded in the E3SM model, where we put a cloud resolving model within each model grid cell to explicitly resolve convection. So let's see how well, if we are able to turn off the deep convection scheme, how well these models might be able to simulate MCSs. So this is one example showing a regional simulation uh, with the uh, weather research and forecasting model, which is a regional model. So after performing a simulation for a warm season for four to uh, four to five months, we track the MCS in observation and in model simulation and compare several characteristics such as the MCS lifetime, the MCS event mean precipitation um, and also the MCS size, the diameter. We see that with this type of um, model simulation, when we turn off the deep convection scheme, a lot of the characteristics of the MCS, including how long they last, how big they are, are actually quite well simulated by the model. Um, additionally, this is one example where we separately look at springtime versus summertime. So this is running a global model uh, called the model for prediction across scales, MPAS, where we have high resolution four kilometer zoom into the uh, United States. And so these are simulations compared to observation at multiple resolution for springtime in April versus in August. Uh, so this is the typical of molar diagram. Uh, we find that during springtime, um, when we turn off the deep convection skin at four kilometer, the model is able to simulate this precipitation really well. Um, and then uh, at even at 12 kilometer and 25 kilometer, uh, the model is not doing 
um, too bad either, even in, when we um, include a deep convection scheme or not. But for summertime, when we, even when we run at four kilometer resolution, turning off the deep convection scheme, the model is still not able to reproduce a lot of the observed convective, uh, that the MCS produced precipitation, suggesting um, the, the more difficult in terms of uh, for the model to be able to reproduce the MCS obs uh, in observation. This is again supported by um, another set of simulation where we use super parameterization in U3SM. So here we zoom into uh, the central United States, uh, comparing springtime in the upper panels versus uh, summertime in the lower panel. So here are the observed uh, MCS precipitation, and then this is produced by the E3SM model with the super parameterization and without the super parameterization. We see that without the super parameterization, the model significantly uh, under predict MCS precipitation, whether it is springtime or summertime. Uh, when we include the super parameterization, where we put uh, a cloud resolving model within each GCM grid cell. The model is able to reproduce the observed precipitation, MCS precipitation quite well in spring, but still significantly under predict precipitation even for the summertime. So again, suggesting that summertime is a much bigger challenge in terms of simulating MCSs. Uh, more recently, the youth resident model, we, now, we are now able to run um, global storm resolving simulation at three kilometer resolution. Uh, we are able to show that um, at this kind of uh, global simulation without deep convection scheme, the model is able to be quite skillful in simulating a lot of different features of the model. And I'm going to show in particular a simulation where we contribute, uh, ran the global E3SM simulation at three kilometer, contributing to a model intercomparison experiment called Diamond 2. This is a 40 day simulation um, uh, at three kilometer resolution where we track the MCSs. So these white blobs over here are the MCSs track in the model compared to the observation. Uh, we see that uh, this is a particular 40 day simulation during January. Uh, so lots of MCSs are, are produced in the observation um, in the tropical region. Uh, the model is able to capture them actually quite well. Um, so I think there is a lot of potential for using um, this type of uh, convection permitting or uh, storm resolving simulation to simulate MCSs, but the but the challenge is still in the summertime, which is uh, what I'm going to talk about for my second science question, which is what limits uh, the predictability of MCS during summertime or contribute to the predictability. Um, uh, one point I want to highlight is that um, MCSs are different from individual deep convective clouds particularly because of the of the longer lifetime, they usually last for six hours or longer. So what might contribute to MCS lasting that long? So in this particular study, we find that MCS produce um, heavy precipitation. And as mentioned before, because of the large stratiform area, they tend to produce uh, this top heavy heating profile. And this top heavy heating profile can generate potential vorticity. And you can actually see as a result of the potential vorticity, you can see this kind of mesoscale vortex providing an uplifting mechanism that can feed back and in increase the convection or strengthen the convection to make the um, to make uh, the uh, MCS lasting longer than what you might expect for a typical individual uh, uh, convective cell, convective clouds. So to see that this is indeed the case, we perform some simulations using the Wolf model by just using two different cloud microphysics schemes. So in the two cloud microphysics schemes, we find that the model produce a uh, slightly different um, he uh, latent heating profile. One being heavier, um, kind of like top heavy uh, heating profile. And as a result, we also see that the simulation that produced the stronger um, top heavy heating profile also produced stronger mesoscale vortex as a result of the potential vorticity generated by this 
top heavy heating, uh, heating profile. And we also see as a result of that, the model is able to produce a longer lived MCS more comparable to the observation than a simulation that, that produced less uh, he top heavy heating profile, suggesting that this is an important mechanism that even if your model is able to resolve deep convection, the microphysics parameterization is still very important because it changes how important this top heavy heating profile is. And so the second point I want to make is that um, when we look at the springtime versus the summertime, we see that uh, the large scale environment supporting MCSs are also rather different. Uh, during springtime, a lot of uh, the MCSs are actually generated um, embedded within strong synoptic system. Uh, so this synoptic forcing um, is easier to be reproduced or simulated by models. And as a result, models also tend to be easy, having an easier time in simulating the MCSs. But during summertime, we see that oftentimes, especially over the central United States, MCS tend to form at, in the presence of a high pressure system. So the high pressure system tend to be unfavorable for convection. But in the periphery, the, um, the, there are northwesterly flow that actually can provide some lifting mechanism for MCS to be generated, yeah, even under this kind of unfavorable condition. So to understand this a little bit better, we have recently uh, published a paper where we uh, perform two kinds of um, analysis compositing the large scale environment associated with MCS to understand what help MCS to, to, to be generated during summertime. So here I'm showing um, the four types of environment when we do a mess, uh, when we do compositing of the large scale environment based on detecting MCSs when they are initiated over the central United States. So we identify four types of environment supporting MCS generation during summertime. Uh, the, the, the two kinds of environment here are quite easy to understand why they are favorable for MCSs, because if you look at the upper level, like the 200 hectopascal geopotential height, you can see this kind of um, cyclon, cyclonic and anti-cyclonic circulation. So essentially providing a advection of vorticity ahead of the anti-cyclonic circulation, so providing an uplifting mechanism. So these are large-scale environment that are supporting MCS generation. But we also see another two kinds of environment that are generally unfavorable, especially for type 4, which actually account for like 30% of the MCS generated during summertime. So in this kind of environment, you actually see a upper level cyclonic circulation over here. So it's very unfavorable because it's actually producing downward motion. At the same time, we also don't see much of a moisture anomaly when we composite this kind of environment. However, when we do another kind of compositing, uh, by looking at what we call convection center composite. So when we composite the environment at the center of convection, we see that for this kind of unfavorable environment, we still see some an moisture anomaly near the surface that can provide some favorable thermodynamic environment that can still help to um, generate MCSs. To understand this type of environment a little bit more, we continue to look at this kind of convection center composites. Uh, so for the four types of environment. So now we are looking actually 36 hours before the MCS are initiated and then 36 hours after the MCS are generated for the top four types of environment. Interestingly, what we find is that regardless of which type of environment that we are talking about, we always see this kind of yeastward propagating environment with potential vorticity helping to generate some uplifting mechanism for the MCSs, except that in these two types of environment, they are large scale propagate, yeastward propagating environment. Versus over here, these are like smaller scale or mesoscale type of propagating environment. Um, so also need to um, make a, a particular point that, uh, so this type of eastward propagating environment exists sometimes like 36 hours before. 
such that they can actually provide some predictability for MCSs. Um, after the MCSs are generated at hour zero over here, you can also see this potential vorticity with a different propagation speed. Uh, these are the actually the PV generated by the MCSs themselves, not to be associated with the propagation of the PV that are associated with the environment propagating at a very different speed. So basically what um, we need to understand is that there are these yeast were propagating environment providing a, uh, an uplifting mechanism, but the ones that are most difficult for the models are these that are like massive scale in nature. Uh, so some of them might be associated with mid tropospheric perturbations. They might be generated uh, originating from the Rocky Mountain. Uh, they might be some residual shortwave trough or gravity waves initiated by the mountains. Um, so in this particular study, we look at a, a particular kind of um, subsynoptic systems that can help generate MCSs. So these are like what we call mid tropospheric perturbation. So we have two data sets. One is an MCS data set, and then another one we detect um, also the mid tropospheric perturbation by looking at the vorticity and to determine how often they actually happen together. We find that 30% of the mid tropospheric perturbation are associated with MCS type 4 environment, but only 10% of the MCS of the type 4 is related to MCS. So meaning that there are many ki other kinds of subsynoptic environment that can help generate MCS, not only the mid tropospheric perturbation. But looking at this a little bit further, we find that if MCSs are generated in association with the mid tropospheric perturbation, they tend to produce stronger or heavier precipitation and also um, a larger amount of precipitation and stronger connection. So, um, as as we mentioned before, so this type of mesoscale environment could be could, could be associated with mid tropospheric perturbation, but they could also be associated with some surface moisture anomaly. So these surface moisture anomaly could potentially be provided by soil moisture anomaly. So this motivated us to also look at how much MCSs might be contributed to the surface evapotranspiration and increasing the soil moisture and therefore potentially help provide a mechanism for helping it um, to predict the MCSs and the subsequent evolution themselves. So here I'm going to show an example of study that we have performed by tracking MCSs, not only in terms of the precipitation amount, but once the precipitation reach the land surface, we use a tracer mechanism to trace how much of the MCS and the non-MCS precipitation contribute towards the surface runoff and then also contribute to the evapotranspiration coming back to the surface. So this is a particular study that we published back in 2020 where we used tracers mechanism to really look into how MCS rainfall versus non-MCS rainfall contribute to runoff and also contribute to the evapotranspiration. So what we found is that um, MCS rainfall tends to contribute a bit more proportionally to, towards uh, surface runoff and a little bit less towards um, evapotranspiration compared to non-MCS rainfall. And this can be understood for the fact that non-MCS rainfall, they tend to be lighter in terms of intensity and therefore they tend to uh, be confined closer to the surface rather than infiltrate deeper into the soil layer. And as a result, they, they also tend to evap ev evaporate a little bit more from the surface and contribute more to the evapotranspiration. So based on this fact, then we originally thought that, well, if non-MCS rainfall is contributing more to the ET compared to the MCS rainfall, then it might mean that non-MCS rainfall is more important for land atmosphere interactions. We found that this is actually not quite the case. So in a very recent study, which is actually only published uh, last week um, in PNAS, where we made use of 
these MCS versus non-MCS data rainfall data set, as well as the soil moisture and the ET track using the tracer mechanism from the land surface model, we find that MCS rainfall actually play a much more important role in land atmosphere interactions compared to non-MCS rainfall for two reasons. Number one, because the MCS rainfall are more intense and they tend to percolate deeper into the soil. Therefore, the soil moisture anomaly coming from MCS also lasts longer. And as a result, the land atmosphere coupling strength associated with the moisture coming from the MCS tends to last longer compared to the soil moisture coming from the non-MCS rain. So without going too much into the detail of this particular study, I want to be able to explain why MCS is actually more important in dominating the soil moisture precipitation feedback for the summer rainfall in the central United States. So we have to notice two facts from MCS rainfall. One is that MCS rainfall are much bigger in terms of this, the, the surface area covered by the precipitation compared to non-MCS rainfall. And therefore, um, MCS rainfall tends to produce these really big contiguous soil moisture anomalies, positive and negative anomalies, so that when you have dry soil compared to the wet soil moisture, you, it tends to produce this kind of local convergence of soil um, of uh, moisture to produce convection during afternoon hours. So MCS rainfall contribute more to this kind of afternoon convective precipitation. But at the same time, because MCS rainfall, they tend to be very heavy in terms of intensity. They percolate deeper in the soil and therefore they last longer and provide a continuous mechanism of ET providing boundary moisture that can help generate subsequent um, or sustain subsequent MCS precipitation. So with that, I'm going to go quickly into my third science question, which is how MCS might respond to global warming and contribute to changes in mean and extreme precipitation in the United States. So in a previous study published back in 2016, based on observation for the last 35 years, we found that MCS um, produce um, heavy precipitation, the 95th percentile precipitation associated with MCS, we have already been seeing an increasing trend over the last 35 years. And this increasing trend in the MCS precipitation is partly contributed by the fact that the lifetime of MCS actually has been increasing in the last 35 years. So looking at the environment that might be helping to support this increase in the MCS rainfall and the lifetime over the last 35 years, looking at the reanalysis data, we find that there has been an increased warming over land compared to the ocean. And this uh, changes the circulation over the US by inducing um, a uh, sea level pressure anomaly. And as a result, these kind of southerly flows that bring in more moisture uh, through the Great Plains low level jet that support MCS uh, environment. Uh, so this is based on observation. But if you look at model simulation projecting like how precipitation during summertime might change in the future, we see that, for example, uh, based on CMIP-5 simulations, basically the models don't really agree very much in terms of whether precipit summertime precipitation is going to increase or decrease. And I think partly it is because of the fact that most global models aren't really able to simulate MCSs, but they are important contribution to summertime precipitation. So in order to really look into how MCSs might change in the future, that motivated us to begin to develop some simple model to see whether simple model can actually give us some ideas about how MCS might change. So recently we published a paper where we um, developed a simple Lagrangian parcel model of convection. So this is very much based on the work from Roms and Quang using a very uh, similar type of idea where we look at a single column of um, parcel model, simulate the mass, uh, the water vapor mass, the liquid water, et cetera, et cetera. So based on this very simple 
uh, puzzle model, we look at what kind of environment help initiate convection. So we look at two types of factors. One is the boundary layer moistening, and the other one is the dynamical lifting mechanism. Uh, so here, uh, what I'm showing in colors here are uh, essentially how deep the convection is being initiated as a function of the boundary layer moistening anomaly and as a function of the dynamical lifting mechanism. And no surprise, you can see that as you have more moistening in the boundary layer, there is a higher chance of initiating deep convection. But at the same time, when you have stronger dynamical lifting, you also have a chance of getting more convection initiation. So by applying this simple um, one-dimensional puzzle model at every grid point of uh, uh, the United States, driven by reanalysis data, we see that even a simple puzzle model like this can reproduce the observed spatial pattern of the precipitation quite well. And then driving this simple one-dimensional puzzle model with global model at every single location, we look at how precipitation might change in the future. So this puzzle model predict that precipitation will decrease in the future compared to the CMIP model simulation themselves using global model, suggesting that even a simple puzzle model like this can capture this increase in the convective in inhibition in the future due to global warming. But still, this is just a 1D puzzle model, not necessarily really modeling mesoscale convective systems. So extending this simple Lagrangian puzzle model to try to capture mesoscale convective systems. We have um, expanded this model into a multi-column Lagrangian puzzle model where we align many, many single column puzzle model in one, in, in one dimension. And then we simulate uh, the uh, one mechanism that help generate mesoscale convective systems, which is essentially due to the cold pool interaction. So in this simple model, the only way that these multiple columns interact uh, through three different mechanisms. One is that um, by uh, having this convection generated per single column, it can induce cold pool and then the cold pool can collide and the collision of the cold, cold pool can generate an uplifting mechanism. At the same time, when you have this heavy precipitation produced by the convection, it can also produce a gust front spreading out, and that can also induce an um, uplift mechanism in other, in other grid column. And we also include a weak subsidence effect. So by only including these simple factors, we find that even a simple model like this can simulate self-aggregation. So here I'm showing a simulation by aligning many of these single column puzzle model with only the three mechanisms that I talk about that make these columns interact. So initially, convections are generated very randomly, but after simulating for about 12 hours, we begin to see self aggregation behavior when we see actually these convection aggregate into much bigger area, very comparable to a 2D cloud resolving simulation. So by looking at which mechanisms are actually more important in generating these kind of organized structure, we see that if we turn off these cold pool collision mechanism, essentially the model cannot reproduce this kind of self aggregation. And if we turn off the gust front spreading, the model also tends to be producing much weaker self-organization. And if without the subsidence effect, definitely you would not be able to get in that. So this is the beginning of using a very simple Lagrangian type of model to help us better understand how global warming may be affecting MCSs in the future. So now with that, I'm just summarizing several points that I was uh, able to make um, um, regarding um, a, a body of work that I'm presenting. So MCSs are ubiquitous and they are important for both weather and climate and important for circulation as well as for the water cycle. Uh, so a lot of our work gets started by developing this MCS tracking method. And as a result, we, we produce uh, 
global data set as well as regional data set of MCS tracking data that can help us evaluate climate models as well as understand these processes. We find that models are more skillful in, MC in simulating MCSs, but mostly only during springtime, not so much in the summertime, even when we turn off the deep convection scheme. Uh, the reason is because MCS in the springtime are supported by stronger synoptic forcing, and therefore they are easier to be model by by the uh, to be to be uh, represented by the model in the summertime uh, mcss are associated with smaller scale yeast web propagating atmospheric perturbations because these perturbations are smaller scale in nature they are actually very difficult for models to be able to simulate and then there is also these positive feedback loops associated with the mcs latent heating that can help provide a feedback mechanism. So if the model is not able to simulate MCS to begin with, it would be missing this kind of positive feedback loop to be able to simulate a longer lasting um, MCS. And then we also show that MCS dominate the soil moisture precipitation feedback, and therefore a model that is not able to simulate MCS in the earlier part of the warm season would also have a difficult time in simulating MCS in the summer because of the lacking of this soil moisture precipitation feedback. Lastly, in terms of how MCS might respond uh, to global warming, we have already seen in the observation data that MCS has been producing uh, more extreme precipitation. Um, and then using a simple Lagrangian type of model, we are now beginning to, to uh, understand this kind of copal mechanism and hope to be able to combine this type of modeling with a uh, sophisticated uh, global cloud resolving type of model to look, uh, further look into the MCS changes in the future. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I hope we'll have time for some questions and discussion. Yeah, of course. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. Or if you don't have a microphone, you can go ahead and type in the chat. Dr. Lee, um, I see that you, you messaged me and said you have a couple of questions. You can go ahead and unmute yourself now. Okay. Uh, hi, Ruby. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much for the so entertaining and very, very uh, comprehensive talk about uh, um, this uh, master system. Uh, I, and uh, I just have a few uh, clarification if you could give me. So at, in the introduction, you mentioned about the dyno variation of the MCS, and you went, uh, you, you said it's the uh, um, peak at midnight. And that slide shows around 6 p.m. Um, uh, and in your talk, uh, you, for your own group research, you didn't uh, mention about dyno cycle, how the dyno cycle is uh, simulated by the model. Um, so that's uh, first clarification. Second clarification is that you show your study um, the long term uh, MCS has an increasing trend, uh, which to me means more uh, MCS related perpetration. And in your uh, puzzle model, you show a drying trend in the central US, which seems uh, contradictory with the observation. So would you uh, clarify these two points? Thank you. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you for the questions. So the first one is related to dyno cycle. Um, similar to what I show from other uh, studies, uh, suggesting like because um, models are not able to reproduce the dyno timing, uh, therefore they infer that models are not able to simulate MCSs. Similarly, when we look at uh, global models, um, even um, uh, at 25 kilometer resolution, such as uh, those that I show from the high res MIP simulations, they also generally have difficulty in simulating the, the peak dyno timing of MCSs um, kind of like around midnight. Uh, when we look at like cloud resolving type of model, like from the wolf simulation or from super parameterization, they tend to do better. Uh, they, they, are, they, they are doing much better in terms of capturing the dyno timing, um, even though I was not able to show that part of the results. Yeah. Um, and 
then for your second question related to the uh, effects of global warming on precipitation or, or MCS particular uh, precipitation in particular. Yeah, so based on observation data, we have, we've, uh, by tracking the MCSs in observation, we have indeed seen that in the last 35 years, especially the extreme precipitation, the like 95th percentile associated with MCS has been increasing. But based on the parcel model, uh, notice that the parcel model with it, um, that the result I show is based on a single column parcel model applied to each of the model itself. So in a sense, it's not really representing MCS, right? So so that's only representing convection in general, uh, probably just like deep convection. So 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 what it shows is that because. Um, Global warming induced uh, drying over land uh, or the reduction in the relative humidity. So generally, it, it inhibits um, convection uh, or deep convection. But in order to really understand how MCS might respond to global warming, we actually need to have the mechanism associated with the self aggregation. So that's the part where we have now begun to to use uh, these multi -co multi column. Uh, parcel model to generate this copal mechanism, but for that part, we actually haven't been able to to do the simulation to look at how uh, changes in the environment may be affecting uh, the MCSs. So I hope that clarifies that. So if if you're looking at just individual deep convection itself, the parcel model says that uh, global warming will inhibit convection, but this is not to say that necessarily that MCS will be suppressed because MCS is not just isolated deep convection. I see. Um, can I just interpret this further? If it's, uh, MCS has anything to do with a uh, planetary wave, and uh, if the hardly uh, cell expansion have anything to do with the long term trend of the MCS? Yeah, so uh, when we look at the large scale environment of MCSs, uh, they are. In springtime, well, first of all, both spring and summer are important because they, uh, there are quite a lot of MCSs occurring in both spring and summertime. Springtime MCSs are oftentimes associated with large scale synoptic system, kind of like frontal system. Uh, so the predictability is pretty high, and the models are also generally easier, having easier time to simulate MCSs. During summertime, we show that there are these eastward propagating systems that help to provide the favorable environment for MCSs. Some of these eastward propagating environment are still associated with large scale synoptic forcing. So even summertime, there are these um, perhaps front, sometimes frontal system that are still providing an uplifting mechanism. But the more difficult kinds are the ones that are Vessel scale or subsynoptic scale in nature. So, exactly what kind of environment are these eastward propagating ones? We have isolated the mid tropospheric environment being one of those, but there are several other different kinds that we haven't been able to continue to look at. Um, and also, how those kind of eastward propagating environments, such as associated with mid tropospheric perturbation, may change in the future is another question that we haven't been able to address. Yeah. Mm, thank you so much. Hi, uh, Lubei, this is Liang. Uh, thank uh -huh. you for such a comprehensive uh, overview of the MCSA. I'm very interested in uh, the results. Some of that is also uh, we, are, we are working on using the CWOF to do understanding what uh, causing, for example, the warm and the dry biases in the central US. And we found that this is very much related to the MCS. Then the question would be, as you mentioned that, you know, these MCSs have such a large scale feature, very large. And these four things you mentioned it's all actually should be able to capture by these big models. So, uh, the, and the, the reason why, for example, summer is so worse than the spring, I think is mainly because there is something to do with the deep convection more frequent in the summertime. And these are the problems. I think so all these larger scale have a problem. So now, from your point of view, so what we are not doing right in the cumulus parameterization? Because <laughs> the diennial cycle, for example, we have papers talking about we can change the cumulus parameterization in different closure. 
we can get the diner cycle right in many ways. And there is also a reason the paper published by Europe says that the, you know, if we consider these, then can significant change these extreme events. So from your diagnosis, so what we should do with the cumulative parameterization? I think there is still some way we can, we can change. Yeah, so yeah, very good questions. Um, so what we, what we have shown uh, is, I think there are two factors. Number one um, is that MCSs themselves are quite difficult um, in terms of the predictability during summertime. So, so that may not have to do with the model themselves, right? Because just that during summertime, a lot of these forcing mechanisms are very difficult to be simulated by the model because they tend to be subsynoptic in scale. Right, and then there are also these feedback mechanisms. So once your model is not able to do something, then you lack this positive feedback coming from the light heating or coming from the soil moisture precipitation feedback, and therefore it makes it further more difficult for the model to simulate MCS later. Right? So I think there are these inherent processes that make MCS difficult. Um, but then in terms of um, the convection parameterization, um, I think that. Part of the difficulty is because um, even though MCSs after they are generated, they are actually very big in size. So you might think, well, so supposedly even a model with 100 or 50 kilometer resolution, they should be able to resolve MCSs. But MCSs started with individual deep convection themselves, right? So first of all, you need to be able to initiate the deep convection. And then secondly, after the, after the Conduction is initiated, the model needs to be able to simulate this organization, the self organization that generate this large organized structure. So, recently we have uh, started looking at several other um, improvements in some uh, convection parameterization to see whether they can help models to be able to do that without having to explicitly resolve convection, like using cloud resolving model. So, one um, such uh, development has been done at NCAR by Mitch Moncrief and others where they uh, developed this MCSP mechanism where they essentially uh, make the model to produce this top heavy uh, heating profile. So once you correct for the shape of the latent heating profile, we find that the model in these can, can, can much better simulate MCSs, especially over the tropical area. But over the central United States, we find that that mechanism itself or, or that parameterization itself has not uh, yielded um, significant improvement yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have another question, if it's not too late, about uh, some of the biases with your convection permitting models that you observe during the summer. Is it possible that maybe biases in the surface boundary condition, such as too much or too little soil moisture, could be contributing to the inability to get MCSs during the warm season. And I wonder if that could even be more of a hydrology issue. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, indeed. Um, like I show over here, so so because the soil moisture precipitation feedback is an important mechanism for to generate this kind of uh, surface, uh, surface humidity and normally, right? So if your model has, ha, uh, in terms of the land surface processes are not uh, representing uh, for example, how these intense precipitation come, coming from MCSs percolate into the soil and how that actually provide this evapotranspiration back to the atmosphere. It could potentially be also like cutting off this uh, soil moisture precipitation feedback loop. So I think there was a recent study published by the NCAR group where they um, suggest that land surface models that Proper, uh, better represent the subsurface processes, particularly related to groundwater component, could potentially improve the simulation of MCSs in uh, in in this kind of like high resolution model, such as uh, the Wolf model. So I th I think confirming that this soil moisture precipitation feedback is an important mechanism. Yeah. Hi Ruby, thank you for a very nice talk. Yeah, so far. You have talked about mostly MCS over the land, uh, where there is sometimes moisture limitation. But what about MCS of convection over the ocean, where you have plenty of moisture to work with? 
In fact, the case there may be actually upscale interaction. For example, with the MCS will be um, uh, essential in the formation or upscale interaction with the MJO, for example. Have you looked into that 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 issue? I think that's yeah. an important area. I mean, earlier work suggests that there's something called super cloud cluster, or they didn't call it MCS, but I guess people identify that. They are very similar in terms of, uh, of uh, self-organization to larger scale when you don't have a limitation of moisture supply. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Bill, for the question. Indeed, I mean, MCSs are ubiquitous over the tropical area, as I show from the global map of mm -hmm. MCSs, right? Mm -hmm. So so they are really important. Uh, so recently, we have combined two data sets. One is the MCS data set, and then we combined it with a data set kind of um, tracking MJO, and we mm -hmm. indeed see that uh, um, MCS play major role in, in MJO or propagation. So so definitely MC, MCS are very important. At the same time, we have also been tracking MCSs and, and associate and to determine how much MCS contribute to the overturning circulation in the tropics. And mm -hmm. we also see major role played by MCS in the overturning circulation as well as the monsoon circulation. Mm -hmm. So so indeed, I mean, MCS is not only important over the mid-latitude region. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. being able to simulate MCS is important for the whole tropical um, tropical meteorology as well as the uh, tropical climate. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We also have a question. Um, Zong Lu actually had to leave earlier, but he did leave me a question to ask you for, so he can listen to the recording. <laughs> um, they said, very nice talk. Do you categorize MCSs based on surface types, land, ocean, and latitudes, tropics, mid-latitudes? Seems like you only focus on mid-latitude MCSs in the U.S. Yeah, so in this particular presentation, I was only able to focus on um, MCS over the US, but as I mentioned, uh, we have now tracked MCSs globally uh, uh, and, and developed this global data set. So we have been able to look at MCS over the tropical area, over the ocean, as well as over land. Uh, we, we find that, for example, um, uh, we've been looking at MCS for um, the role of MCSs in the South Asian monsoon, and we, we indeed see that um, MCS play a major role in the monsoon onset um, and another processes such as MGO as well. Yeah, so, so I, I, I completely agree that MCS's role in, over the tropical region it are important and we, we need to continue to look at that. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, unless someone interrupts me right now, I'm going to consider uh, our Q&A section over. Thank you everyone for participating and thank you Ruby for coming to talk to us today. This was a great talk um, and everyone can look forward to the recording and we will continue with our seminar series next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nia. We'll send you the recording uh, once we get it. Thanks. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.